Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Update on the Laboratory Diagnosis of Lyme and Other Tick-Borne Diseases. I am Jennifer Woods of LabRoots and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Diasorin Molecular LLC. To learn more, visit molecular.diasorin.com. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. I'd like to now welcome our speaker, Dr. Philip Malloy, Medical Director, Tick-Borne Diseases, Eastside Clinical Laboratory, East Providence, Rhode Island. Dr. Malloy, you may now begin your presentation. Thank you, Jennifer, and I would like to add my welcome to the audience. Thank you for all joining in today. Hope you find this presentation interesting and useful as we wade through the sometimes confusing waters of diagnosing TBDs, tick-borne diseases. The objectives today are to um, reinforce, remind you about the increasing prevalence of tick-borne diseases led by Lyme disease, followed by the other emerging agents. I wanna take this time to introduce abbreviations, which there's no shortcut. I think you're going to have to get used to um, these terms, MTTT and STTT. I will explain that in a minute. These are the paradigms. These are the names of the tests we use for serologic diagnosis for tick-borne diseases. The last objective is to reinforce a topic called co-infections. A single tick can carry multiple pathogens and a single victim person bit by that tick can come down with more than one disease at a time. Not at all unusual to see a patient with Lyme plus Babesia, Lyme plus Anaplasma or any of the permutations. So let's talk about these things. <clears throat> Here are some references here for your review. I am reminded also that this talk will be archived and able to be viewed later. But these are important, current, and up-to-date um, references focusing on Lyme disease, less so on the other agents. Lyme is where most of our confusion comes from. So this is who I am. I hope you can um, take your own time to read this. I'm putting this up to convince you that I am experienced and credible, I hope. I uh, did my training when I was a young doctor with Dr. Alan Steer, the discoverer of Lyme disease in 1976 in Lyme, Connecticut. I have been the medical director for tick-borne diseases at several laboratories over the years, at the same time that I am a clinician and see patients in Lyme and tick-borne highly endemic areas. South Coastal Massachusetts, Cape Cod, Nantucket, places I still work today. And I've been involved with research um, over the years. And I put this up because a lot of people uh, don't realize that Babesia is an important pathogen transmitted by, uh, via blood donation, being screened for now. And Borrelia miyamotoi was a brand new previously unknown pathogen that was discovered in our lab. The first case in North America was discovered in 2012 and published a few times. <clears throat> so these are the ticks. This is Ixides ticks going from left to right, um, engorged adults, nymphal and larval stages of the tick. On the right side are the size, is the, the nymphal ticks or the larval ticks right now are the ones that are out there. They're about, if you took your ballpoint pen and made a dot on a white piece of paper, that's about how big these ticks are now. This enforces how easy it is to overlook these ticks. Their bites are frequently totally asymptomatic and in places that you don't see, which is why we get these conditions. Here are the infections, the TBDs, the tick-borne diseases we'll be talking about today. In the first column is the name of the organism. In the second column, the name of the disease, the lingo we use. There is a column on the right that talks about abbreviations. And in the far column, I wrote down the years that these 
that the first human cases were discovered. So Lyme disease was discovered in 1976. Medical history is very interesting. We don't have time to talk about the fascinating ways that these diseases were finally solved and stumbled upon. And the most recent pathogen on this list, Borrelia miyamotoi, the first cases in humans in the world were in 2011 in Russia. And the first case, as I previously mentioned, in North America was in 2012, late 2012, published in 2013. So here are the ticks that transmit these um, TBDs, tick-borne diseases, to us. And you could classify them in different ways. The question in the upper right says, which infection doesn't fit in with the others? And of course, the way the slide is set up is to call attention to you that HME, human monocytic ehrlichiosis, or just ehrlichiosis, is transmitted by a totally different tick than the common deer tick that we're all used to. The dot on the back of that tick reminded someone of a lone star. That's where the tick's name come from. It has nothing to do with this tech, tick being from Texas, which it is not. The reason it's important to know that different vectors transmit different TBDs is because in different regions of the country, some ticks are more prevalent than others. Some regions of this country have no deer ticks. You can't get any of the deer trick transmitted diseases unless there is the vector there. There are large parts of this country, most of the western half of this country, where the lone star tick is not found, so you can't get HME in those regions. It's important to know a little bit about your local epidemiology. There's another way to ask that question, which disease doesn't fit in with the others? The top three on this slide are all bacteria. And Babesia is not a bacteria, it is a parasite. So everyone knows, I believe, that Lyme is called, the germ that causes Lyme is Borrelia burgdorferi. It is a spiral-shaped, spiroketal bacteria. Anaplasma and Ehrlichia are bacteria closer to the Rickettsia family. You'll also see from this slide, and I'll just go right to the next slide, the asterisk next to the three bottom pathogens is important because those three pathogens in the bottom live, as you can see, in blood cells, granulocytes, monocytes, and erythrocytes, or red blood cells. Is that important? Yes, it's important because you can find these in a purple top tube in a specimen of whole blood. An easy place to look for anaplasma, Ehrlichia, and Babesia is directly in red, red blood cells or monocytes or granulocytes. You can actually visualize these organisms in a blood smear. In contrast, Lyme disease, Borrelia burgdorferi, is not trophic for blood tissue and is rarely, not impossible, but rarely able to be demonstrated in blood. It likes certain tissues, skin, joints, neurologic tissue, but doesn't like to live in your blood. So the important thing in the way of diagnosing these infections is to know that some of these, it's a very good, fruitful place to look for them is right in the blood cells. So here is a map of the United States. This is Lyme disease prevalence. Um, if you looked at the map of Lyme disease prevalence and compared it to five years ago or 10 years ago or 15 years ago, you would see how much it has gotten denser, more cases, and it has expanded. 10 years ago, you wouldn't see all these dots in Maine, New Hampshire, northern New England states, and it wouldn't be drifting as far south all the way down um, Pennsylvania, Virginia, but it's very much expanded right now. The other pathogens, you will notice that the deer tick transmitted pathogens on the top three um, maps, Lyme disease, babesiosis, and anaplasmosis, since they're transmitted by the same vector, they share a lot of geographic distribution 
in contrast to ehrlichiosis and even Rocky Mountain spotted fever, which is more mid-Atlantic and down into the southern states. It will help you a lot to remind you what geography you live in. It will give you a clue as to what the diseases will be that you will come across. So this map shows the historic in the light color at the bottom of the country, the southern states, southeast part of Texas all the way to Florida and up into most of the southern states. That was the, up until 10 years ago, that was the geographic area where the Lone Star Tick occurred and the darker brown are where the Lone Star Tick has migrated to over the past decade. In where I am from, which is New England, I am from Massachusetts and the Rhode Island area where I work now. Ten years ago, we never saw HME because we never saw the Lone Star Tick in those geographies. Now, look at the expansion. So these are emerging infectious diseases in terms of more and more cases every year and more and more geographies. And by the way, more and more different germs are out there. You know this, this is to remind you that tick-borne diseases are seasonal and they peak in the summer. Is that important? Yes, it's important because if you work in an urgent care setting, an emergency room, or you're on the front lines in some other way, if you are in a tick endemic area and someone comes in in June or July and August complaining of a fever, a headache, myalgias, and tells you you feel like they had the flu. If you diagnose a summer flu in that patient, you will probably be wrong. Influenza is a winter disease and tick-borne diseases are summer diseases. Starting about now, this is early April, for the next several months, depending on where you live in the country, people who present to you with nonspecific febrile illnesses, myalgias, headaches, fever, I recommend your assumption be they have a vector-borne disease and not the flu. I, I don't think on Nantucket and Cape Cod we should be diagnosing the summer flu in June and July and August because we'll probably be wrong. So how do we diagnose infectious diseases in general? So this is a generalization and infectious diseases are diagnosed in essence, two different ways. Show me the germ or show me the immune response to that germ. How do we directly demonstrate the germ? Well, as you can see on this slide, historically we have used culture, stains. Nowadays we use PCR and this is not an exhaustive list. Ten years from now we'll be using next-gen sequencing and so forth. But you can demonstrate the organism in an involved tissue, and that will help you make the diagnosis, like a throat culture, for example. An indirect way of diagnosing an infection, the most common thing that will resonate with you is serologies, acute and convalescent serologies, for example. That's how we diagnose hepatitis B and C and parvovirus and many diseases. We even diagnose um, tuberculosis frequently by skin testing, which is an indirect cellular immune, indirect reaction to the organism. These principles, show me the organism or show me the immune response to the organism, carries over to tick-borne diseases as well. In Lyme disease, it's difficult to show the organism directly. It's not impossible. And as I mentioned to you before, Lyme disease does not live in the blood typically. And it's a little bit more difficult and challenging. And there is only a scant number of organisms. So it, we rely on serologies mostly for Lyme disease. Traditionally, we diagnose Lyme serolo serologically. Early in an infection, the germ is there. A patient is sick. And we have better luck in diagnosing most tick-borne infections by looking for the germ the day the patient becomes symptomatic, very early, a week later, when they're in the emergency room, when they're in your urgent care center, 
Frequently, we can diagnose tick-borne diseases by showing me the organism, and two weeks later, three weeks later, they will develop a serologic response. The term window period refers to a period of time where a patient is infected, frequently symptomatic, the organism is able to be demonstrated, but there is no serologic response at that time because it takes two or three weeks to develop a detectable immune response and a positive serology. Very important point there. So if a patient is sick on day one and you order a serologic test for anaplasma, for ehrlichia, for babesia, you will miss the diagnosis. If you order a PCR, you're likely to uh, make the diagnosis. The more acute, the more likely you are to be able to diagnose this disease by PCR or by demonstrating the organism. And as weeks go by, serologies become helpful. Very important. I'm going to show you a couple of slides that demonstrate that. This slide is not specific to any in infection. It's a generalization. The relationship between symptomatic infections, the left curve, and the antibody response. So you are sick for days, you have a positive blood culture for days, and eventually you develop a serologic response. This is well documented for many pathogens that you are familiar with. Especially today, we'll be talking about the tick-borne diseases. It's true for um, HIV, it's true for Zika virus, it's true for so many infectious diseases. The germ is there, later, seroconversion occurs. And the main point I'm going to emphasize is that if you order serologies on the left-hand side, you will miss the infection if you order serologies and you're too soon for the antibody response. It's not because the technology is poor or something's wrong with this methodology, it's because there is no immune response until two weeks, three weeks into the infection. There's that phrase, window period. It's a period of time when the germ is there and a patient is seronegative. So this is a generalization. This is the sequence of what happens. Now, some <clears throat> I'll just skip over that. Now, some pathogens have a very, very narrow window of bacteremia or viremia in the case of Zika virus. And you only have a few days or a week to catch that infection. An example of this would be Lyme disease, for example. Lyme disease, as I mentioned, is not traditionally bloodborne. It's not trophic for blood doesn't like to be in your bloodstream for a long time. It's not at home there. It's briefly in your bloodstream after a tick bite inoculates you. And you only have a brief amount of time to pick it up in the bloodstream. This is why we must rely on serologies for Lyme disease. We do see patients who come in and they're both PCR positive and antibody positive for B. burgdorferi. And guess what? One day later or two days later, their antibody levels are much higher and their PCR is now negative. PCR, for those of you listening who aren't familiar with it, it's called per polymerase chain reaction. You should view PCR as a molecular version of a culture. It is a way using sophisticated molecular laboratory techniques, a direct a demonstration of the organism's DNA is made in the bloodstream. Think of it as a molecular culture. Well, here's a curve that looks a lot different, doesn't it? Here's a curve <clears throat> where the bacteria is there, and then it starts to fade, and then there are multiple peaks and lowerings and increases. So this is an example of a germ that lives in the bloodstream for a long period of time and overlaps the serologic response. And as you can see in the top, this is, would be very typical curves from a patient infected with babesiosis. Remember, babesiosis loves your blood, 
That's where it's at home in your body. It's a blood-borne disease like malaria. It lives in blood tissue, in erythrocytes, and it waxes and wanes for weeks and months, and sometimes many months, giving your antibody response plenty of time. So it's not at all uncommon to see Babesia linger in the bloodstream this long. It's the opposite part of the spectrum as Lyme disease, for example, which hates your bloodstream and is only there so, so transiently. So <clears throat> the symptoms occur. I want to remind you the symptoms will occur early in the course if there is, are symptoms. And there is the diagnosis, uh, the illustration of the window period. Throughout the whole window period, if you order serologies, by definition, they will be negative. So I have a couple of more <clears throat> points to make on this relationship between bacteremia and serologies. Is it possible? We hypothesize that there would be a period of time, a window, when you would order PCR just a little bit too late, yet you're a little bit too early for serology. There is definitely precedent for this in the infectious disease world. We know, for example, on Zika virus, you are no longer viremic, and there's about a week window where you're negative by PCR and you're too early, and so you're negative for serology too. So how do you, how do you deal with this? If you have a symptomatic patient, you expect, you anticipate a diagnosis of a tick-borne diseases, and the PCR is negative, and the serology is negative, what would you do? I would repeat the serology in a week. Notice how helpful a follow-up convalescent serology will be in a symptomatic patient in which you suspect an infection who is seronegative. And of course, the CDC uh, recommendations and IDSA recommendations are if you suspect Lyme disease and the test is negative, consider doing a convalescent uh, serology test. It's right in the CDC recommendations. So let's talk about specific ways we diagnose Lyme disease. You can culture the germ. Um, it has minimal, if any, clinical utility. It has a lot of research utility. But it takes weeks or a month to grow in culture, which limits its usefulness when there's a sick patient in front of you. What you should know about PCR is that it detects the organism's specific DNA sequences. The turnaround times are rapid, less than a day. Um, what takes the longest in a PCR test, if you've ever ordered one, is getting the specimen to the lab. Once the lab has it, they can order it, they can run this test and report it out rather quickly. It's useful in synovial fluid in the case of Lyme arthritis. It's useful for a few days in blood. You can find it in the skin and in the CSF. Most Lyme disease is diagnosed serologically. And traditionally, as we will see soon, um, the serology is involved using ELISA test and another test called a Western blood. I would like to show you what a Western blood is on this slide. A Western blood is when you take the Burgdorferi and put it essentially on a nitrocellulose strip, a long, skinny strip of paper, and then you incubate the patients. You, you basically dividing the Burgdorferi up into a, all of its separate antigenic proteins, lipoproteins, and immunogenic areas, and you see if the patient has something in its serum that reacts to it, antibodies. Now, these two Western blots look different, don't they? <clears throat> the one on the left and the one on the right. I put these up to make a point. This is, of course, the same patient's serum. This is a single blood draw done two different ways by a Western blot. And the reason I put this up is to make a point that um, Western blots are very slippery tests to do. They're difficult to standardize from one lab to the next, on one strain of B. burgdorferi to the next. They can look very different. I caution you to 
not to compare Western blot. I think clinicians do fall into traps occasionally by saying, um, I did a Western blot on a patient and I did it again six months later and there was a new band there. Well, does that mean the patient has a new infection or has relapsed? Or was it just done technically in a different lab by a different technician in a different methodology, maybe? There's a lot of difficulties interpreting Western blots, knowing what a positive is, agreeing on whether or not a Western blot has changed. So I'd like you to just um, reflect on these two Western blots on the same blood draw on a given patient. Lyme is traditionally, as you all know, diagnosed by a two-tiered or two-step serologic profile. And everyone who's in this business knows that Lyme recommendations are to start with one test that's considered to be a pretty sensitive test because we don't want to miss infections. And then to confirm it with a specific test because we don't want to overcall Lyme disease either. We don't want to say there's false positives. So there are two types of two tier tests out there. And STTT stands for standard two tier test. It's what's been endorsed by the FDA and the IDSA for the past uh, 27 years now. 1994. It was based, by the way, on a very, very small number of patients. Less than 30 positives were in the studies that led to this. Which band should we count? All that sort of thing. That's how far back it dates. Historically, the FDA and researchers and clinicians have struggled with interpreting Western blots, especially IgM Western blots. And there's been almost a decade's worth of research to see what can we do to improve Lyme disease testing. And it led to an important announcement about a year and a half ago by the CDC endorsing MTTT as the modified two-tier test. Let's talk about that for a minute. The modified two-tier test has been shown in many validation studies to perform equal to or superior to the STTT with less confusion and no Western blot. That's its main advantage. So here is the diagram of the STTD. Start with one test on the left-hand side, and if it is equivocal or positive, do a second-tier test. And the yellow circles are to remind you that <clears throat> um, it is strongly advised not to do IgM Western blots in patients who are symptomatic more than 30 days because of the number of false positives and false negatives. The circle at the bottom of this page reminds you what I mentioned already, that if you suspect Lyme and the test is negative, please do another test. And acute and convalescent serologies are invaluable for many infectious diseases. Here is a diagram of the MTTT endorsed since about 2019 and brought up by many commercial labs in 2020, recently. Both tiers are ELISA based and there is no Western blot. That is the novel thing. This test has been validated as mentioned to be as good as or superior in different stages of Lyme, avoiding the potential confusion and sometimes misleading results that are seen on Western blots. So current Lyme testing, I'm speaking to you now, as, as you saw from my bi biography or bibliography up front, that I work for um, the Northeast Division of Sonic Labs, which is um, basically in New York and in Rhode Island. We introduced about a year ago the MTTT in our lab, and 90% of our volume of Lyme serologies are now MTTT. Traditional STTT is still available, and there are multiple options on using on what you would like to use for the first tier and what you would like to use for the second tier. The CDC and IDSA, Infectious Disease Society of America, doesn't tell you what you have to use any approved first tier test and any approved Western blood for the second tier. And that's about 10% of our business. People have asked me, why do those 
still use um, the STTT? Um, is it more valuable in some circumstances? And I think the answer is pretty straightforward. It's that tradition, comfort level, what I'm used to. I like, I'm comfortable seeing the report. Um, we're all resistant to change. Some of us are early adopters for medications and diagnostic tests, and some of us are slower adopters of new things. So here's an example of an actual lab report that will leave our lab and go into the hands of an ordering clinician. You will see the name of the test under the word results in bold face capital letters, Lyme modified two-tier test and in parentheses MTTT. And under that, you will see tier one. And then even below that, because tier one was positive, tier two gets done. Tier one uses an ELISA that combines IgG and IgM. Tier two separates IgG and IgM, so there are more lines or more reports on that. But this is an example of what a test result, a report back to your clinician, back to your EMR, whatever, uh, would look like. So <clears throat> before we leave Lyme disease, there are a couple of important points. Since IgG and IgM antibodies persist for years, there is no role for routine follow-up serologic testing after you diagnose and treat a patient for Lyme disease. And the reason for that should be obvious. I have Lyme arthritis. You diagnose it. You treat me. I am going to be seropositive for another decade or two decades or longer. Even IgM persists in Lyme disease. So what do you learn from a follow-up serology? And experience has shown, and there is data to support this, that both patients and doctors, patients who get copies of their reports and doctors get confused more than helped by follow-up serologic testing. We don't have a blood test for a cure for Lyme disease. There are many unorthodox, unconventional, non-validated tests, and the CDC will outline them on their website. And the internet is full of um, unreliable information about Lyme disease. Now we're going to leave Lyme and talk about some of the other tick-borne diseases. Just so you can have a little fun and take a breather, here's some medical history for you. Who is Nancy Gray? I'm not violating anybody's privacy here because her story is on the internet, in the public domain. She was a summer resident of Nantucket at the age of 59 in the summer of 1969. She returned home after spending the summer in Nantucket, went to her local emergency room with an acute illness. The lab tech noted intraerythrocytic inclusions, a manual differential. The blood was sent to the CDC and ultimately diagnosed as the first case of Babesia D. microti. That was 1969. Two well known doctors from Massachusetts, Dr. Spielman is a <coughs> public health epidemiologist. The late Dr. Spellman and Dr. Damon was a pathologist from the Brigham Hospital, uh, went to Nantucket, <clears throat> solved a lot of the mysteries about this disease, identified the white foot mouse as the reservoir, a previously unrecognized tick vector called the deer tick, briefly was called Ixides damini after him, renamed Ixides scapularis for some reason. And lucky he did that, lucky these doctors did that, because it paved the way and it helped Dr. Steer solve the transmission of Lyme disease three years later. More cases of babesiosis, which the first name of babesiosis was Nantucket fever. Clinically, it causes symptoms that you can read on this page. The bottom bullet <clears throat> reminds you that it there's a lot of babesia can linger in your bloodstream for a long time, even while you're asymptomatic, and you could potentially donate blood. It could be um, transfused, your unit of blood could be transfused into a recipient, and you could cause babesiosis in a recipient. So this is an example, this is an exception to the rule that all these diseases are transmitted only by ticks. Here's the exception. It can be transmitted by blood donation if you're unlucky. How do you diagnose Babesia? You look for the organism or you look for the serology. 
Now look at the bullet. I have bold faced in the bottom of the top half of the page. In acutely infected patients, they are PCR positive. They are smear positive. The patient is sick. The patient may be hemolyzing. And they are antibody negative. I'm emphasizing this because if you order a serology at that time, you will be misled. You'll say, oh, I've ruled out Babesia in this patient. If you order a smear or a PCR, you will make the diagnosis. And below in serology, ultimately the patient will seroconvert. You have seen slides like this before during your training of Babesia easily demonstrated living inside red cells. Babesia is an emerging and expanding infection. This is one state. This is Pennsylvania. Most states in the Northeast and the upper Midwest are showing graphs like this. <clears throat> Let's talk about HGA, human granulocytic anaplasmosis. It was first identified in the upper Midwest by a friend and colleague of mine, Dr. Johann Bakken, former president of the IDSA, the American Society for, Infect Clinical, uh, for Infectious Disease, Infectious Disease. The first case in the Northeast was on Nantucket by a guy I still work with, Dr. Lepre. It's called the G in granulocytic means that's where it lives and it's doxycycline responsive, unlike Babesia. Clinical spectrum, no rash, no arthritis, acute flu-like illness. You will be tempted to say that this patient has a summer flu. No, in July, in coastal Rhode Island, on Cape Cod, on Nantucket, with or without other clues that you see on a CBC, not all patients have a low platelet count, but it's an important clue to us. Not all patients have the elevations and transaminations, but it's a very important clue. A lot of people get sick with this and get better, but if you are frail or immunosuppressed, or on dialysis, or have a splenectomy, it is potentially a fatal disease. There are lots of fatalities from this disease in frail patients. Yeah, let me go back one side. I would like to emphasize that there's no known chronic phase of HGA. I mention that because I see doctors order all the tick-borne disease tests, everything for patients with chronic arthritis, chronic fatigue, for anaplasma, for ehrlichia, for miyamotoi, they don't cause arthritis, they don't cause chronic symptoms, it's a waste of medical resources to order, um, to order tests that, have, that are total non-fit for a patient's presentation. Just because Lyme is on your differential diagnosis doesn't mean HGA and HME and the others are on here. How do you diagnose anaplasma? Same as all these infections we're talking about. Acutely infected patients are PCR positive and antibody negative. I have seen many cases in my career of patients in the ICU or in emergency rooms where a doctor will <clears throat> ask a clerical person to order a blood test for anaplasma and because of a breakdown in communications, a serology gets ordered by mistake, comes back negative, and the patient remains acutely sick until another doctor will order the PCR and make the diagnosis. It's a beautiful picture, isn't it, of an anaplasma um, intragranulocytic inclusion which somebody that's experienced at looking at smears will be able to pick up. There's not a lot of them, and it's not easy to see unless you stumble upon it, but when you see it, it's diagnostic. HME got its name. <clears throat> it's caused, the name of the germ is Ehrlichia chaffeeensis because the first case was in a military recruit from Fort Chaffee in Arkansas. The M stands for monocytes. It is doxycycline responsive. We never saw it in the dark brown areas on the map I previously showed you until the tick started expanding and moving north. Now we see it in New England. If you could tell this disease from anaplasma or miyamotoi on the basis of looking at the patient, you're better than me because it's hard to tell 
when someone walks in with a febrile illness and no rash and they look sick, how can I tell by looking at the patient if it's HME, HGA, Miyamoto, or Babesia? I can't tell. This, uh, this graph, uh, sorry, these comments resemble the comments on HGA. A lot of people can get better by themselves, and a lot of people will succumb to this if they're very frail and immunosuppressed. Slightly different geography. Can't get HME unless you live in a region where the Lone Star Tick is. You've seen this slide before. You diagnose it in an acutely infected person by PCR, and eventually they will seroconvert. Brelia Miyamoto, we briefly mentioned, first human cases in 2011 in Russia, first New England, North American case was in a patient diagnosed in 2012 and reported in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2013. And there's a lot of burgeoning literature on this new pathogen. This looks like some of the other slides too. No rash, nonspecific flu-like illness, a couple of clues, and you can see the publication I referenced here is that it can, these diseases mimic each other. I'm bringing that up because I need help from the laboratory to know what, which patient is infected with Miyamoto versus HGA versus HME versus Babesia. They, have, they don't all have the exact same treatment and they have different implications. I can't look at a patient and say, oh, this patient has HGA and look at another patient and say, this is HME. I've showed you this before. Acutely sick patients are PCR positive and seronegative. So all of the germs, to summarize the laboratory diagnosis of these, all of these germs have in common, when they're acutely sick, you need to rely on PCR, and eventually they will seroconvert. So here's, I'm going to finish by talking about um, <clears throat> the last topic is co-infections. So here's a patient that um, I was lucky enough to have this uh, camera in hand, right? Doesn't get more perfect or textbook than this. So the question is, if you saw this rash, would you order a blood test? That's the question. And of course, the joke that goes with it, the doctor says, yeah, it looks like it might be an arrow through your head, but just to be sure, I'm going to order some blood tests. Well, the reason I order tests in patients who have classic EM is not to diagnose Lyme disease, is to make sure they don't have something else. Because co-infections are so common. I'll show you a little bit of data here. This is from my old lab in 2016. If you look at the left, you'll see we cast the net of all patients who had acute Lyme disease. And you can see on the right, 6.3% um, were also PCR positive, or blood, if you will, blood culture positive, or Babesia, and so forth. If you look at Babesia patients, 47% um, of Babesia patients either had old antibodies to Lyme or were co-infected with Lyme. It's not rare. So let's leave my data from my old lab and talk about Mayo Clinic data. If they, looked at, they looked at a series of Babesia cases two years ago. And look at the numbers that were co-infected with the other pathogens. It's not trivial. If I have a case of Babesia and 24% of them also have Lyme, or five or 8% have other pathogens or multiple pathogens, for me, these numbers are big enough to make me want to look for these other germs. Therefore, laboratories will offer you ways to group tests. There are acute tick-borne disease panels to use in the summertime. A typical acute panel might look like this, molecular tests by various methodologies. You could do them individually, you can do them, you can fuse um, probes and primers and do multiplex. Don't worry about the methodologies. Worry about the concept. Look for the germ if you think a patient is acutely symptomatic. Why does the acute panel also have a serology for Lyme? Because 
the window to pick it up in the blood is so brief, it's commonly missed by whole blood PCR. So we're never going to escape the need for serology as one of the things we rely on to diagnose Lyme disease. So here are the core technologies in acutely sick patients. Antibodies and everything else is PCR for the other pathogens. Now let's just suppose a new germ were to evolve next year and became increasing emerged high prevalence. It could be added as another PCR should that happen, which it is happening. So I'd like to end by giving you a few um, pieces of advice and common pitfalls. The first pitfall is ordering the wrong test. I have a patient with chronic arthritis. Oh, what the heck? I'll order the whole panel and get all the germs. Well, Babesia, HGA, HME, those Miyamoto, they don't cause arthritis. They don't cause chronic anything. Um, why are you looking for them if they are a total non-fit for the patient? Chronic fatigue workup. Why would you ever look for HGA? I have no idea. I think it's a mistake to do IG West, IgM Western blots at all because <clears throat> I have not ordered one myself in over two decades because I think it's an unreliable test and so does the CDC and IDSA and we are all discouraged from doing them after 30 days of symptoms. Unfortunately, laboratory requisitions don't ask that question. We don't capture that information on a requisition. Is your patient symptomatic for more than 30 days? If we did, we would not do IgM Western blots. Doing follow-up serologies and retreating for residual positive antibodies because they're seropositive forever. And believing all the information, getting led astray on the internet. So here are some other emerging tick-borne diseases. I'm just throwing them up here for you to See what's coming down the pike. There are other Borrelia species, Mayoni, um, obviously discovered by researchers at the Mayo Clinic. Uh, another virus called the Heartland virus. Perwassen virus is here now. So there are some of the other tick-borne diseases that you will uh, learn more about, I think, in the future. It's not going to go away. My last slide is just a timeline for these other diseases. When the ticks were discovered, Babesia being the first, and you can follow this timeline to the right, and who knows where it's going to go from here. So that's going to conclude the formal part of my talks, and I wanted to make sure I ended long enough. I hope that um, the host of our meeting will remind you that this is going to be archived and available for you to listen to and view again in the future. But I'm going to pause here and. <clears throat> Um, let um, Michelle or Jennifer take over and go into the, some questions if you have any. Thank you, Dr. Malloy, for your informative presentation. And we will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you would like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for. Let's get started. Our first question is, so there's no cure for TBD. Does it survive in the blood indefinitely? Um, so that's um, not exactly, the question is not exactly true. There's no cure for TBD. That's not an incorrect, that's not a correct statement. All these diseases are curable. There is no, what I meant to say, and I hope I said, we can go back and look at those slides later, is that there's no blood test to prove I'm cured. Just like there's no blood test to prove I'm cured from TB or syphilis. If you give me a standard curative treatment for syphilis, my VDRL is still positive. It's an antibody-based test. If you treat me for TB with whatever regimen and cure me of TB, my skin test is still positive. So we don't have a blood test to prove you're cured. But yes, um, these are all curable diseases. Thank you, Dr. Malloy. Our next question. So when Lyme serology remains positive for years, how do you diagnose new Lyme in someone who has tested positive before besides clinically? Can you use the same MTTT test as the baseline and compare IgG and IgM levels? 
That's a great question, and it's a very challenging question. And there is, the short answer is no. Um, you are stuck being a clinician and making the judgment. Um, the only way you can rely on serologies is if a patient eventually sero reverted. In other words, enough years went by and their antibodies faded. You treated them early. They didn't have enormous sky high levels of antibodies. Years went by and now they're sero negative and then they become sero positive again. It's very difficult to say my IgG level or my IgA level or IgM level was a certain number, let's say four or five. And now it's a seven, um, unless they're done on the same test run. And nobody archives specimens in a freezer for years. There were labs that did that at one time, but no longer. If I had um, your blood test from five years ago, I would thaw it out. If I had that specimen, I would thaw it out and I could tease it out. But it's, there are pitfalls and it's not reliable to say um, a certain number was four a few years ago, and now it's a seven or an eight, because that's not statistically a different number if it was done with different batches of reagents on different years. So you're left doing the best you can clinically. Thank you, Dr. Malloy. Our next question, can PCR give false positives? Oh, oh, my screen jumped. There we go. <laughs> can PCR give okay. false positives since this is detecting fragments and not the patient's ability to keep pathogens from producing right. symptoms? That's a good question. And um, I think there are probably two parts to the question. If not, I'm going to answer it in two parts. Um, a PCR can be false positive in a way. A false positive means I'm detecting a signal and to something that isn't there. So if I have Lyme arthritis and you tap my joint and demonstrate uh, it's a positive PCR, meaning that the organism's DNA is in my bloodstream, and you treat me and cure me, and right away do another aspiration of my joint, the PCR is still going to be positive because I have fragments of previously live but now decaying DNA in my blood, in my joint fluid that will still result in a positive signal. If you wait long enough, your body will resorb and digest DNA fragments. DNA fragments don't live forever in your blood or synovial fluid. So yes, in that situation, you might think it would be a false, false positive. I would not look at that as a false positive. I would say it's a true positive for what you are testing. The DNA is still there, but the patient is treated. I, I like to wait before I do another joint tap and look, I would wait a month or two. And then I know, then I expect the DNA to be gone. Now, a false positive, you might mean something else. Um, are you coming up with a signal for one of these germs when it, it's not there and it never was there? And I would like to say that never happens. And in an ideal lab, it never happens. The only way that happens is if I contaminate it, if I have a contamination issue in the lab, I won't, die, I won't get a positive signal for Babesia in your bloodstream unless there's Babesia there or I've contaminated the specimen. The lab uh, goes through in, inordinate. We don't do Babesia smears or cultures or anywhere near where we're doing PCRs or molecular work. So, and, and the Thermocyclers are all closed systems now. They're not open. So the lab does extraordinary things to avoid contamination right now. So the only uh, way you could get a real false positive is by contamination, and I'm not sure that happens these days. It did, though, 10 or 15 years ago. But labs do a good job at, at, with protocols to avoid contamination. And we um, get surveyed and get accreditation. That's part of our accreditation to make sure we're not, we don't do that. Thank you, Dr. Malloy. Our next question, do different Western blot, te Western blot tests look for different antigenic targets? And what is the correlation between bands, kilodalton, and antigenic targets? Um, an antigen is something that stimulates your immune system, and that's what's on the piece of paper. And that's what you make antibodies to, and that shows up as a band. So I think it's sort of um, a fluid term. An antigen is 
a word we use about the compound, the molecule that is stimulating your immune system, and the band is the reaction that we're seeing on the piece of paper. And there is there are dozens of strains of Bieberdorferi out there, and and they're at different stages of being propagated, and they are drift, and different strains have bands at different molecular weights, and the ways that these strips are prepared. It's not as standardized and as rigid as you think. That is the point. Thank you, Dr. Malloy. What is the recommended test for a patient suspected with Lyme disease? Is, T is the TBD panel test pref the preferred order, so to rule out other non-Lyme diseases? So that's a good question, too. And if it was the summertime, if it was uh, Memorial Day to Labor Day in a super endemic area, I'm not sure where this question came from, but if you're on Cape Cod or Long Island or coastal New Jersey or someplace that's really hot, I would um, always look for co-infections. Yes, I would do that. If you have a patient in the winter with a swollen joint and you want to make sure it's not Lyme disease, I would order a Lyme serology, and that's what the guidelines suggest, to rule out Lyme arthritis or chronic neurologic Lyme, do a Lyme serology. In an acute patient who's been sick for one week, look for co-infections. Thank you, Dr. Malloy. It looks like we have time for just a few more questions. And the next question, how do you communicate to physicians the difference in interpretation when they're used to looking at bands on the Western blot? Well, change is difficult for everyone, and it's difficult to let go of things that you're used to, and it's difficult for me to turn in my old junk car and ride a new one because I like my old car and even if it breaks down. And that's, I, I would tell doctors that, um, I would ask a doctor um, how much help he got from the last IgM Western blood or do you ever get confused by Western bloods? Or does it ever come back and surprise you? I can tell you if you take a single specimen for a patient who's had Lyme, put it in the freezer, that single specimen, and do an IgG Western blot on it 12 times once a month for the next year, they'll be drift. They're not all going to be identical bands. And I see that in the lab. And knowing that makes me happy to um, transition from Western blot to the MTTT. Thank you, Dr. Malloy. Our next question. Uh, let's see. Is blood the usual sample for the PCR test for Lyme, even though the bacteria is not trophic to the blood? So for the first week of Lyme disease, it could be in the blood. It's the only specimen because you're not going to do, a, if it's causing heart block, we're not going to get cardiac tissue. And most of you are not going to be doing synovial biopsies or aspirations and sending that. By the time it's a swollen joint, synovial fluid and blood are the two most reasonable specimens. Thank you, Dr. Malloy. And we have time for one more question. If in Lyme disease, the infection is in the blood for a brief time, where does it go next? And why can't we do a PCR for this area? Um, it does go to the skin, and you can do a PCR for the skin. Um, it just is invasive, that's all. If you do punch biopsies of the skin, um, it's very reliable. Um, when it goes elsewhere in the body, it's not, it's not as accessible. If you could biopsy tissues with no downside, um, I, would, I would do it more often. <clears throat> First of all, um, one of my slides said there's a scant number of organisms, even when it's in the joint. Uh, it's very scant. That's why we have to amplify the DNA sequences, the specific DNA sequences. Um, that's a good conceptual question. I think the answer is it's just too hard to find, and there's just there's one organism. If a pathologist looks at a 500 visual fields, you might come across one or two organisms. It's just too hard to hunt it down. And the other side of that question is it's very immunogenic to your immune system. So the immune response is very reliable as the weeks go by, and the hunt for the DNA of Lyme is very difficult. Thank you, Dr. Malloy. Do you have any final comments for our audience? 
No, thank you for uh, listening in, and I hope you found the presentation uh, useful, and even if you would like to, go back and listen to it again. Thank you. Thank you again, Dr. Malloy, for your time today and for your important research. We would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Diasor and Molecular LLC, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Please join us for our second webinar next week on April 9th, Implementation of a Multiplex Molecular Test for Anaplasma, Babesia, and Ehrlichia. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye.